Now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome to the show this morning. Of course, it is Tuesday as we get this last week of February uh, underway. And of course, also uh, a couple of important inflation reports out later this week on Thursday. We will get the uh, personal consumption expenditure index. Now, that is the actual inflation report that the Fed looks at. Um, you know, we talk about CPI, we talk about PPI, but it's the trimmed mean PCE that is what the Fed actually looks at in terms of inflation. So that number will be out on, on Thursday. So again, this is kind of the markets, you know, kind of leading up to that. But that'll be the one thing, to, that'll be that kind of the report to uh, look at this week. Now, earnings also, we're back, we've got about 90% of all the earnings in. So most of earnings season is complete now. And unsurprisingly, earnings are coming down. Forward estimates are coming down. And as we talked about before, you know, these forward estimates are always great. We come out of the gate and earnings estimates are set way high and then we keep bringing them down as, as companies come in. So yes, we're beating earnings um, and that's great. We've had a good beat rate this quarter and uh, naturally when you lower the bar enough, you're gonna get a high beat rate and that's exactly what's happened. So, you know, a couple of things that are, are worth paying attention to as we go forward is can those earnings continue to hold up is going to be the big question. A lot of that's going to depend on economic growth. So other big news, Amazon is going to join the Dow on Monday. And so it'll be now part of the Dow. And it's interesting because I was actually talking with Michael Leibowitz about this yesterday. Um, there's some old theory um, that has been around for years and it's called Dow theory. And this was when you would look, take a look at the Dow industrial companies and compare that to the Dow transports. And that would give you kind of an indication of what's going on in, in the economy. So if industrials are doing well and transports aren't, well, maybe the economy is slowing down because we're not transporting goods, which means you know potentially we're not buying stuff as much, not needing as much stuff in the economy. Uh, and vice versa, if transports are doing well, that suggests that you know, the, uh, the, the, the economy is doing well. Um, we're, we're moving a lot of stuff around the country. Well, the problem is the Dow industrials really kind of aren't industrials anymore. 
um, Apple, Amazon, uh, these other comp com companies are now in the industrial. So it's really not a reflection so much of the industrial side of the country um, as much as it used to be. So I'm not sure Dow theory still holds, but nonetheless, uh, the Dow has been lagging the S&P. And so <laughs> in order to get the index moving again, you've got to get the FANG stocks into to, to the Dow. So the question is only now, when does NVIDIA get into the Dow? That's, that's now the only question that really remains for most investors is when we can get NVIDIA into every single index so all the indexes perform. Uh, nonetheless, that's a, a bit of a topic that we'll talk about this morning as well. Markets are, are all doing well. And uh, again, as we talked about here over the last couple of days, there's been nothing wrong with that. But we'll talk about you know, this kind of this idea of the entire market now chasing one stock. So um, that's going to be one of the implications we're going to have to deal with. Um, other than that, also, you know, when we take a look at you know, the economic data that's coming in, uh, economists are now ratcheting up their uh, economic outlooks for this year. And we're now starting to see a lot of these Wall Street analysts now ratchet up their year-end targets. So when we came into this year, the average Wall Street estimate that for this year was about 5,000 to 5,100. That was about the average and saying by the end of 2024, the market should trade at 5,000 to 5,100. Well, we're already above 5,000. So not surprisingly, all these Wall Street analysts are now coming out. We've now got targets ranging from 5,400 to 5,800 by the end of this year. So we've had a huge increase in the expectation for the market this year. So analysts are getting very, very bullish on the markets. And that, my friends, is why today's article on the website is called, This is Nuts. And we'll talk a little bit about why this has a very similar ring to what we saw back in January of 2020 when we were talking about markets doing exceptionally well. We had very big moves in the markets. We were very deviated from long-term uh, long means. And that was just before kind of the whole collapse. So again, that's kind of where we see a lot of that same sentiment. But before we get to that, let's talk about what you need to know before the bell this morning. Uh, so again, markets, uh, as we talked about, really kind of ad nauseum here over the last couple of days. And we, we discussed this on uh, yesterday is that the market is trading within this very defined kind of trend channel uh, that goes back to November. And every time we get to the top of this trend channel, we sell off. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. Got to the top of that trend channel on Friday, sold off a bit yesterday. This morning, uh, futures are a little flattish. Uh, they're up a little bit. We'll see how, you know, how the market opens and, and plays today. But again, we just stay really kind of confined to this trend channel. So nothing really outside of the ordinary. As we, and, and as we said yesterday, as long as this 20-day moving average continues to hold, that is now key support for this market. A break below that 20-day moving average is going to be an indication of a bit, uh, a bit larger move to the downside. But right now, certainly nothing, nothing warranting that at the moment. Um, MACD signals, you know, on a buy, flirting around, you know, kind of flipping back and forth here at very high levels. Market is overbought, but you know, we're still trying to work through some of that. The, the, the big kind of note here is, though, is that we do have this rising market and we do have a negative divergence in relative strength. So that's kind of one of the kind of the warning signs that this market's getting a little bit long. Also, uh, we've now had 15 positive weeks out of the last 17. That is the longest stretch for a bullish advance in the markets going back to 1989. And so the, the important thing to remember, as, as we talked about some yesterday, is that the last time we had a similar advance like this was going back from you know, March to, to July of last year. Then you had that correction. So again, you know, there, there's going to be a correction at some point now. It could be a month from now. It could be two months from now. So again, don't get all negative at the moment. Start you know, uh, going to a whole bunch of cash and, and making drastic changes to your portfolio. We're going to have a correction of five to 10% over the next few months. But again, when it's going to occur and what triggers it, who knows, right? Uh, look, the Fed could come out next week or next month and say something that you know, says, hey, you know what, we're not even gonna the lower rates this year. And, and that could spook the markets, right? Because the markets are so dependent right now on rate cuts. However, the easing of financial conditions because of this rise in the markets, uh, the decline in yields, 
Those easing of financial conditions have already acted as 100 basis points of Fed rate cuts for the economy. So again, we see this increasing exuberance. We see this increase in financial conditions that is actually acting as easing for the markets. So again, that puts the Fed in a position where they don't have to rush to cut rates. The market's doing the work for them at this point. And that could potentially be a trigger that disappoints the market here at some point over the next few months because the market is, is betting very heavily on these rate cuts coming now. The, again, they thought it was coming in March. They've now adopted to that, that, oh, we're not going to get it until June. But if we, if we start to look like we're not going to get a, a rate cut in June or July, that could be the trigger for a bit of a sell-off this summer. So that's what I'm saying. It could be a while before we break this. But again, this advance is very long already. So again, uh, expecting a correction should not be a shock at this point. So do a little preparation, take some profits, rebalance risk. Again, try to remember how you felt last October. I was getting a ton of emails last October about this market's never going to stop going down. You know, I'm, I'm losing all my money, etc. But just three months earlier at the peak, market was never going to stop going up. So again, that's psychology at work and just understand that that's what's going to happen at some point. So prepare a little bit in advance. Yes, you may miss a little bit of the upside, but odds are you're going to get a better opportunity to put that money to work. Okay, that's what you need to know before the bell this morning. We come back from the break. We'll talk about why this is nuts. Once again, don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax friendly retirement paycheck. Perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855 RIA Plan, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment advice.com and now another page from the real investment advisors investing manifesto a passive investment portfolio requires active risk management it's not a choice it's necessity diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss let us actively help you reach your financial goals with ria advisors neither bull nor bear ria advisors 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com you're listening to the real investment show And welcome back to the show this morning. So this is nuts. Um, so this weekend, I was reading some articles and doing some some research because I lead a, I lead an exciting life, and you know, never a moment dull moment in my household. By the way, I learned a very valuable lesson yesterday, Brent. So what is that? Well, I, I thought it'd be sweet, mm. right? And, you know, my wife had a really hard day at work oh. and she came home and yeah. she was a little bit stressed out. Yeah, was, you know, it's that kind of thing. I said, well, honey, I tell you what, it's, it's kind of nice outside. So I'll take you to go get a scoop of ice cream. There's a Baskin Robbins not too far from my yeah. house, right? Yeah. So let's take you down and get a scoop of ice cream. She says, no, I can't. I'm too fat. She's not fat. Where? <laughs> right. And I said, I made the mistake. That's where I made my <laughs> critical mistake. 
I said, okay. <laughs> now, okay. In my, well, in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, she just doesn't want to go get ice cream, right? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the appropriate response, then, of course, I saw tears start to come into her eyes a bit. <laughs> a bit and then I realized at that moment that I'd made this crucial mistake, which was I should have said, no, you need to get two scoops because you're too skinny. That's what yeah. I should have said, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, in hindsight, should have said, you're too skinny. You need some ice cream. Go eat a cheeseburger. Yeah. <laughs> okay did not resolve it. Uh, okay did not resolve it. That immediately applied. She was correct. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, being married... I tell my son this is like, you know, being married is a challenge because every day the rules change. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to kind of guess. Nobody tells you the rules change from one day to the next. You just have to guess. <laughs> I guessed wrong. <laughs> but you lived and you're here today. Yes, I did. I did live. And, you know, it's so funny, too, because, you know, she's very strong. And I've told you this before. She's a very strong, independent woman. She scares me. <laughs> but... She's at the same time, you have to coddle her a lot yes. and baby her. So anyway, this is nuts. So oh, oh you mean the article? The article, yes. Yeah. Back to the article. Not your marriage. Yeah, that's 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 a whole nother story in itself. <laughs> she now wants to get a, a large piece of she saw a, a video. Yeah. Right? She now wants to get a, a big piece of land somewhere. And just adopt dogs. She wants to be a dog adopter. A dog whisperer. It, uh, kind of like a dog. She saw yeah. a guy yeah. who just goes to stray animal shelters mm -hmm. and just adopts all the dogs. And he takes them out to his property and lets them run around. And, and so now she thinks this is, this is a, a, a good thing to do. And then, of course, along with that comes ducks, chickens, oh, min yeah, miniature the, pigs, miniature goats. The whole menagerie. Yeah, exactly. She knows nothing about farming. <laughs> Or ranching. Well, you always wanted to get out of town. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just telling you. Her uh, her idea of this relationship is that she goes and finds the animals. I have to take care of all oh, of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I know how that works out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <sighs> Going to leave the country here soon. Anyway. This, Me meanwhile, back on the show. <laughs> back, back to the show. This is nuts. <laughs> Uh, so I wrote, uh, this is funny, I had to chuckle. So I, I told you, I'm reading, reading articles this weekend, and, and I, I run across this article by Brian Sozi over at Yahoo Finance. And I had to chuckle a, a bit because when I was reading this article, um, he makes the comment that, you know, he's he's getting older and he's losing his hair and that you know he's been writing about the financial markets for almost a decade and i had to pause right there because go back a decade that's 2014 financial crisis is 2008 2009 which means he hasn't really been through a, a bear market yet uh, of any consequence and, and by the way brian's always always very bullish on the markets and of course it's it's that's always seen for the last decade is a bullish market but I, I like the fact he's talking about getting old and and you know his hair's thinning and and he's you know he's having to write about markets and I'm like you know I've been doing this for 35 37 years now <laughs> big difference <laughs> so anyway Brian ain't seen nothing uh, yeah <laughs> when Brian sees a real bear market he won't have no hair left let me tell you <laughs> um, but but it, so I'm reading his article though and he's talking about the 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 optimism and the sentiment in the markets. And it reminded me of an article we wrote back in January of 2020 called This is Nuts. And and this was obviously just a couple of months before, you know, we shut down the economy and markets declined by 35%. And we said, you know, I wrote when I wrote that article, I said, when you sit down with your portfolio management team and this is the first comment, the first comment that's made is this is nuts, it's probably time to think about your overall portfolio risk. And we started reducing portfolio allocations in January and February of, of 2020 um, because we suspected that something was coming. And the, the reason was, and again, you never know, this, and this is the whole point, right? Nobody knew we were going to shut down the economy. 
and this is always the case, what causes big downturns in markets are always unexpected exogenous events that nobody knows about. Everything you see on television, anything you think you know right now, if you're in the chat right now, put up all the reasons why you think the market is going to crash over the next 12 to 24 months. Put them in there. Put all the reasons you want in there. And I'm going to tell you, every one of them are wrong. And the reason is, is because if you can think about it, the market already knows about it. What is going to get the market is something that we are not even talking about, not even considering at this point. And you can dream up the, the craziest things, right? Aliens land on the earth. That would probably do the trick, right? Uh, but it's going to be something that nobody's expecting. It's going to show up out of the blue. There'll be some event, whatever it is, and that's what's going to spook the markets. That's what's going to change the dynamic of the market from buying to selling. And it's just the way it works. But there are some precursors for that. In other words, you've got to have the environment for that unexpected exogenous event to occur to have an impact. Think about it this way. If everybody was sitting in cash right now, right? No, literally nobody's invested into the financial markets. And we have a financial crisis or we shut the economy down again. What's going to be the impact to the market? Very little, right? Because nobody's invested in it. So it's going to have very minimal impact. So if everybody's negative on the market and everybody is basically out of equities for the most part, I'm, I'm being, you know, exaggerating here a bit. But if everybody's super negative about the, about the market and then you have an event, there's going to be very little impact. So you, in order to have this impact to the markets, you've got to have a very optimistic market. You've got to have an, a market where everybody is invested everybody's optimistic. And then that way, when this unexpected exogenous event occurs, that's what triggers this spree of selling all at once that causes a big decline in stock prices. And that's the environment that creates it. And it's interesting because there are precursors that we can see historically that tell us if we have that type of environment or not. One of those is what's happening right now is that analysts are kind of falling all over themselves to come up with reasons to justify why this market can keep going up. There was a, a, a recent um, commentary by UBS as an example. And she said that earnings growth for the tech sector is robust, justifying its valuation premium. Really? Yes, earnings are growing. That is true. But does it justify the current valuations that you're paying for some of these stocks? Let's take NVIDIA as an example, since it's the poster child for the entire market right now. NVIDIA currently trades at 32 times price to sales. Now, we've gone you know, through the past, and I've got links in the article if you want to go to the article. Uh, at, it's at the website right now, realinvestmentadvice.com. And I've got links to an old article talking about why 10 times uh, price to sales is crucially important. And if you don't understand why 10 times price to sales is a problem, you need to read that article. But at 32 times price to sales, it is beyond the ability of a company to ever grow into that. And even though NVIDIA is growing earnings at leaps and bounds momentarily, it cannot grow into 32 times price to sales. Hence, a coming problem. There's another problem with this, too, is because while NVIDIA is surging and creating massive revenue growth right now, and again, look, we're long NVIDIA right now, so we, we own the stock. We did take profits in it, but we're still long the stock, so... I'm not telling you not to own it. I'm just telling you what the, 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 the issue is. But more importantly, when NVIDIA reported earnings last week, the entire market went up 2% in the day. So we are now assigning the valuation and earnings growth potential of NVIDIA to the entire market. And we're saying, oh, because NVIDIA is growing at 400%, then every other company is also growing at 400%. But that's not true. 
if NVIDIA is growing leaps and bounds, and if NVIDIA is going to grow into actually their valuation at 32 times price of sales, that means that other companies have to lose market share. Intel, AMD, you name it. And, you know, Broadcom. They can't all be growing in the same market at the same rate. Somebody, there for every winner, there has to be a loser. But then also, we've got to talk about the other companies in the market. So we'll talk about that when we come back from the break. Don't go away. Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Oh, Red, I declare. I plum missed that candy coffee. Whatever am I going to do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? I never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn, the special topic discussions, and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Remember, February, 29 days. So they're just going to drag this month out as long as possible. A friend of mine, his son's getting married. They have now scheduled their wedding on February the 29th. The Real Investment Show podcast. And so this is genius, though. On his part, he's only got to remember his anniversary once every four years. Exactly. So, now, the bad side is if you forget that, you're really in the doghouse. Yeah, there's that. Right? Yeah. So. At realinvestmentadvice.com. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the show. 
John, if your wife wants to eat seven layer cake, you let her eat seven layer cake. Give her two pieces. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, why this is not. So we left off talking a little bit about NVIDIA, its valuation. And if, and if one company is gaining market share, then somebody else has to be losing it, right? And if NVIDIA is going to maintain its growth rate and is going to grow into its valuation, it's going to have to own the entire AI market, which means that ultimately companies like AMD can't. Right. So there's there's the underlying trouble long term. But however, if we go look at other companies in the S&P 1500, so this is the, the 1500 stocks uh, of the S&P 500, uh, sorry, of the S&P 1500, there's a lot of stocks that are trading well above 10 times sales. And so this is just a, a kind of a, a, a list. But for example, Wingstop is trading at 21 times price to sales. Now, how is Wingstop benefiting from NVIDIA, right? I mean, now you can certainly make some links that, oh, okay, what they're going to do is they'll, they'll incorporate AI into their ordering process. Okay, probably. But how are they going to grow fast enough to justify 21 times price to sales? Eli Lilly, okay, great. You can make a case for that. The GLP-1s, they're currently trading at 21 times price to sales. And if you get 70 million Americans all on GLP, great. But to justify 21 times price to sales, they have to go into debt every year, spend nothing on R&D, spend nothing on payroll or legal costs, spend nothing on operations of the business. They have to return every cent two times over back to the shareholder. Can't do it. So can they grow into 21 times sales. Okay, but let's, we'll assume they can. But what does that have to do with Fair Isaac, which is a credit reporting agency that's also trading at, at nearly 21 times price to sales? So the problem is this, is that the market is now valuing everything at astronomical levels of valuation. And we're just chasing stock prices higher at this point. We're no longer looking at valuations and fundamentals, which I know that's a, that's a quaint, old-fashioned concept. But that's the issue that, that we're into these days. And, and again, if one stock is doing well, then you have to, to wonder about other companies that are losing share. And we have this whole idea right now, this whole feeling in the market that, well, this market can't do anything but go up, right? And we warned you about this last year in June, July of last year. We said, hey, when everybody feels this way, typically you're going to get a correction. And that's why I keep saying we're probably going to get one sooner than later. Um, but that's the risk. Warren Pies recently did a, a very interesting analysis, and he put this table together. And, and again, this table is going to be hard for you to read because it's a lot of data, so don't worry about it. I'm going to explain it to you. But if you want to look at the table in more detail, go to the website and uh, click on the article. But Warren Pies did this, this table, and, and, and the premise of the table is, is that what happens to markets after they hit all-time highs? And this is the bullish narrative, right? Every time when that market's new high, we get new narratives out. It's like, oh, we hit a new high. Well, that means the market can just keep going up. And over the next 12 months, after the markets hit new highs, markets are always higher a, a year later. And that's true, right? That is a true statement. But see, they never tell you about what happens next. What about 24, 36, 48 months later? You know, where are markets? So he did this whole table and he actually laid the data out. Now, his whole premise was, is, see, look, every time that the markets hit new highs, 12 months later, markets are higher. And on average, you know, they're up, you know, anywhere from 11 to 15 to, you know, 16 percent. So with markets are new highs, you should expect some stellar returns over the course of the next 12 months. And that's awesome. Nothing wrong with that. But then he has the data sitting right in front of him and he completely misses the conclusion, which is that the next bear market started on average about 24 to 36 months later. Now, there were four periods in there, of course, where markets hit new highs and then just kept going up. But that was where we were coming out of very deep valuation oversold conditions. 1974 is an example. Had a very long run before the next bear market. 
But on average, it's about three to four years, maybe two in a lot of cases. Uh, just for instance, you know, uh, we hit a new high, and I'll just, you know, the first one on the list hit a new high in 1954. You were up 36% later a year from then. In 1956, you hit a bear market. And the problem with the bear markets is, is that, yeah, you made those gains. You made that 36% advance, but then you hit the bear market and you gave up most of those gains. And so that's the problem. So when you get to these more exuberant markets, and again, just because you hit new highs, that's one thing. But when you hit new highs with a lot of exuberance like you have now, you're often a lot closer to a correction that removes a big chunk of those gains. And that's the risk that, that, as investors, we have to look at. And, and so, you know, every weekend in our newsletter, we publish our technical weekly indicators. I showed you this yesterday a bit, but, you know, we're at 95 right now. And that's a very, very high level historically going back to 2000, you know, for this indicator. And so just technically, we've come a long way very quickly Call option volume on the S&P is getting extreme. In other words, people are taking on much more speculative bets, piling into options in the mega cap growth and technology sector in particular. And these levels of option exuberance have often preceded market corrections. Because you're taking on the most speculative form of investing. You're taking on a lot of leverage with a binary outcome. The thing about um, options is that you either win or lose everything, right? Because they expire worthless. So it's a binary bet. And so people are willing to take on that binary bet when there's a lot of speculative activity in the markets. But here's something that really jumped out to me over the weekend is that we run this weekly analysis on the markets. And if we look back over time, there's only been one period where the market, the, the divergence between short term and longer term moving averages diverge to this degree. And when you have a, a big ma major divergence, right, that's telling you that there's something going on in the markets. And from 2006 until 2000 and, and basically 21, markets traded within a fairly defined range. MACD indicators, actually, I need the lower panels, uh, Brent. The markets traded within a fairly defined range. Divergences, and, and as you would expect, market divergences were never that great. Until we injected the economy with $5 trillion worth of liquidity and, and the Federal Reserve started doing $120 billion a month in QE, you had this massive divergence in these moving averages at, to a level we hadn't seen before. Of course, in 2022, we corrected all of that. But since then, we're now back to that same level of divergence, quite extreme, but yet we don't have monetary stimulus, we don't have all these financial supports, we don't have all these bailouts, but yet the markets are as exuberant and are acting as if all that liquidity is there, which is quite fascinating. But that does tell you that markets are well ahead of what valuations, at, at, at least at current levels, can certainly justify. Bullish optimism also is in extremes. We take a look at the 13-week moving average of net bullish sentiment. So this is professional and, and retail investor sentiment, bullish versus bearish. It's at the highest level of bullish in a sense, really the peak of the markets in 2022, and even higher than it was at the peak of the market in 2023 last year. Sorry, I said 2022, uh, going into, uh, yeah, 2022, sorry, when we had the bear market. So again, a very, very high level exuberance. And you'll note that historically, whenever the 13-week moving average of net bullish sentiment is as high as it is, it's always corresponded with a larger correction at some point. Now, again, not tomorrow, not next week, but within a reasonable period. And such makes sense. I mean, just basically when you have everybody kind of on one side of the boat, something happens that draws investors back 
to the other side. We have a huge compression and volatility right now. There is no volatility in the markets. Nobody is expecting a crash. Nobody's hedging for a correction of any sort because nobody thinks the market can go down from here. And so this becomes the fuel for that reversal when all these things have to be unwound when all these things have to, you know, when you have to reverse the sentiment, when you have to reverse the positioning in the markets, when you have to, to actually reduce risk, it all tends to come in a single wave. And interestingly enough, while everybody's talking about, hey, we're going to get Fed rate cuts, this is good. When previously, when you've had high levels of bullish sentiment combined with extremely low levels of volatility, that was corrected when the Fed cut rates. Now, previously, the Fed was cutting rates because of a problem. Is the Fed going to cut rates with no problem this time? Maybe. But the bottom line is that the market is currently trading at levels that remind us of the last time that this was nuts. Be right back. Investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance, guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So as I said, on Friday, we're going to look at uh, inflation report that the Fed looks at, which is the trimmed mean personal consumption expenditure index, price index. And that is a gauge that supposedly is more akin to what is happening with the consumer and the economy as overall. But it's interesting because there's, again, there's this ongoing dichotomy between what's happening with actual inflation versus what we read in the headlines. The headline inflation is going to continue to decline over time simply because of the mathematical comparisons and how we, how we measure it. 
but the average consumer is dealing with a very different environment. And this is why there's such a disconnect right now between how the how Wall Street views the economy. Again, you take a look at Wall Street. Wall Street economists are very optimistic about the economy. We're going to grow at 2.2 percent this year, and um, you know everything's great. And and you know, but yet you take a look at presidential approval polls. 59% of Americans think the economy is doing poorly. So why this big disconnect? Well, as we talked about on the show earlier, that for the average person, wages haven't kept up with the rate of inflation and food costs are now eating up 30% of incomes. And it's interesting because there's a Wall Street Journal out this morning. It says food is taking a bigger bite out of your income. And this is a very real story. And people are having to become a lot more creative about what they do to consume and what they do to eat, et cetera. People are having to make substitutions. Uh, there was a, a, a comment here about Sarah Smith. and That's really her name. <laughs> Maybe it was changed for the article. But Sarah Smith and her husband love making elaborate dinners, such as chicken cacciatore or stuffed pork chops with fresh spices and herbs. Now they make tuna casserole and her recipe is egg noodles canned tuna canned cream of mushroom soup onions and garlic and she even admits she goes it's not healthy but it's food and so people are having to make these changes to try to bring food costs down and maintain their budget because they simply just don't have the money to sustain their lifestyle the way they did before. And because of that, they're a lot less optimistic. Well, this economy, you know, everybody says it's doing great. Look how well the stock market's doing. Again, consumer sentiment is rising from the investment standpoint, right? Stock markets are going up. People feel better about that. So if you measure consumer sentiment from that standpoint, everything's good. Start asking families about, are they making ends meet? And start getting down into kind of the crux of the family function. It's a very different story, which is why economic polls miss a lot of that, because they don't ask those questions. And we make assumptions about things because the stock market's going up. Well, that means everything's getting better. But yet we have economic growth that's being supported by debt issuance rather than economic growing economic activity. And, and, and I want to be clear about that because economic activity is occurring. People are spending more money. And remember, we measure economic activity by dollars spent, not volume purchased. Retail sales is a good example of that. So, yeah, it may seem like things are firing on all cylinders, but again, you just read story after story after story of, of average Americans that are having a tough time. People are resorting to growing gardens in their backyard, making substitutions. Um, one family is going out, they're, they're doing more deer hunting and more fishing to catch their own food, to try to offset costs of consumption at the store, buying in bulk, uh, skipping on organic, these type of things. So people are having to make these tough choices in order to make ends meet. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting, um, just recently, Dave Ramsey, who's debt counselor, of course, and very famous, <clears throat> made a comment to a caller. And a caller had called into the show and he's like, hey, I'm having trouble making ends meet. We make $150,000 a year. I can't remember the exact number, so don't quote me on this. But like we make 150,000 a year and we're spending like 25 grand a year on childcare, uh, preschool. And he's like, well, that's ridiculous, right? You, that's just spending too much of your money on, on preschool. But that's the cost. And the reason that's the cost is because of what we did back in 2020. Because remember, we gave people money, additional money for childcare. So what happened was, is that you give people additional money for childcare. What does childcare providers do? Yeah, they hike rates. So we had this massive surge in child care cost. You've had this massive surge in food cost by companies. And that's not going to reverse. Companies, and it's interesting, uh, President Biden recently made the comment that food companies are gouging Americans, right? And that's not really the case, is they're, they're passing on higher input costs to consumers. That's their job. 
Their job is to protect their profitability. So it's interesting as investors, we want companies to be profitable. As Americans, we don't want companies to be profitable, right? You've got to pick your battle. So the problem with food costs, though, is they are never coming back down again. Because that's the way inflation sticks. When we raise prices, prices don't go back down. That's why we don't have a, you know, when oil prices went negative a couple of years ago, we didn't have 25 cent a gallon gasoline like we had back in the 70s, right? Oil prices went down, but we never got back down to those levels. And we never will because we've increased cost over time. Costs become sticky and wages eventually have to catch up with those costs. Unfortunately, wage growth is not keeping pace because we're now making substitutions in labor. We wrote about this a couple of weeks ago talking about wage cost and immigration and how the Fed recently said the quiet part out loud is saying that immigration is working at a higher rate. In other words, they produce more for less money. They work for lower wages. And that's suppressing wage growth across the scales. But that all impacts the average American. And that's why you, that's why you have this big dichotomy between what people say and what the market's doing. You have this dichotomy between what people are, are, are dealing with versus the government-produced economic data. And this is why there's such a, a pushback on government economic data going, oh, that's, it's, you know, it's garbage. Nobody believes that. It, right? it doesn't measure anything. Well, it's impossible to measure inflation as an example. Your inflation is different than my inflation. If you live in California, their inflation is different than Texas inflation. If you live in New York, your inflation is different than that in Florida. If you're older, your inflation is different than if you're younger. There's all these variables, right, that cannot be encapsulated within one report or one measure. But again, it's also very true that we have, have been, we have been, ever since the turn of the century, manipulating inflation data to suppress it in order to keep Social Security payments low. We used to just measure a basket of goods, which was a better measure. Back in the early 80s, we just measured the change in a basket of goods that the average consumer purchased from one year to the next, and that was inflation, and it worked great. And then we realized that Social Security benefits were going up too much and costing the government too much money, so we had to figure out a way to, to suppress that. And that's become the norm ever since. So those things aren't going to change. And so as investors, we have to understand that there is a vast difference between what the government is saying and what's happening on the surface, and we can't conflate the two. In other words, as an investor... Pay attention to what the government data says because that's what the market's going to function off of. Yes, I understand. In reality, there's a huge difference between those two numbers. What's happening on the ground is important, and that will eventually take shape in the economy. And then that's ultimately where the market and the government data will get revised lower to reality. But that's, that's the, the span of time that you deal with. And that's why you never know when these things are going to occur. Is it going to be six months from now? Is it going to be a year from now? Is it going to be two years from now? You don't know. But what you inherently know about the economy, what we all know about the economy, the true economy, what's happening with the average American, we all know that to be the case. That will ultimately be reality. And markets will ultimately have to reprice for that. But again, that could be quite, quite far down the road. You know, and, and, you know, another one, just very quick, you know, um, we talk about labor. You know, most of the jobs being created, they're, they're low, lower wage paying jobs. They are uh, high turnover jobs. And so those, when you have the vast majority of your job creation in lower wage paying areas, it pulls down the entire rung of, uh, of, of wages. And the more that we implement AI and technology and robotics and all these other things that displace human labor, the more you suppress wages. So 
while AI and, and technology and all this is great, and government economists talk about, oh, this will increase productivity so much. It's true. It will. We'll have a huge we're gonna have a huge surge in productivity in the future because of AI and technology. The impact on the average American won't be great. All right, wraps up the show for the day. Be back tomorrow with Danny Ratliff uh, picking up on the markets. Be sure to go by the website. The latest article is out talking about this is nuts. Um, markets are right now kind of flattish this morning. Nothing really exciting after yesterday. Yields down a bit. Bitcoin up this morning. So, again, it's kind of same, same as it was yesterday. See you back here tomorrow. Have a great day.